All right. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, we have a lot of slides, so we're going to go right into it. Uh, my name is Wayne Huang, and we have our colleague, uh, Roman, uh, with us, Fernandez. Uh, we work for Amorai Technologies. I'm co-founder and CTO to Amorai Technologies. So today we're going to be talking about dry exploit, um, circumventing automated and manual detection of browser exploits. What's up there is the uh, Chinese wording for uh, dry bed download, uh, which actually existed for many years before the term dry bed download uh, came about, because this type of attack was uh, quite prevalent in Asia. Um, I was, uh, I was doing research, I was doing uh, black box scanners at that time, and uh, we weren't able to crawl a lot of the web pages because of the dynamic content, so we started to embed IE. And then we wanted to have mass crawling and SQL injection results. Uh, we had many crawlers crawl for many days, and then the end result was all, the, all of the boxes ended up with malware in it. <laughs> We're like, oh my gosh, so what happened? So actually, uh, we, we submitted a paper to the uh, WWE conference in two, uh, 2002. In the paper, we described how we embedded IE, and because we had to embed IE, we had to sandbox IE in order to prevent um, these uh, exploits from uh, <clears throat> attacking our IE. So that, that was uh, how, how this uh, technology started. Uh, the slides are not in your CD, we apologize. Uh, it's right now on uh, <clears throat> slide share, so if you go to www.dryexploit.org uh, or you follow the Twitter, uh, you can download it right now. So today we're going to be showing one type of browser exploit, which is the drive-by downloads. Let's define that. Uh, so hackers distribute malware by poisoning legitimate web websites, and what's typical is they inject malicious iframes into HTML content, uh, malicious iframes into legitimate HTML content. And the affected websites essentially become a delivery mechanism for malware. They appear normal, and the victims do not need to click or agree to anything. They simply, and, and simply connecting to the infected website executes the attack. Uh, recent incidents include the Aurora incident, which happened, which began sometime in June last year uh, until Feb, uh, February of this year, when Google reported uh, and, uh, and the news went, uh, went to the media. Uh, it was a targeted attack. It used the IE zero day and was confirmed publicly by Google, Adobe, Juniper Networks, and Rackspace, and a total of 34 organizations were targeted according to coverage on media. Uh, a recent one, DNF666. Uh, if, you don't, if you haven't heard of this, you can go to our blog, just Google for the keyword. Uh, it started since March 2010, initially leveraging an Adobe Zero Day. Uh, the victims included Wall Street Journal, Jerusalem Post, and then we later found out that all of that effort was just to steal uh, online, uh, accounts to online games in Asia. So, so the second wave and the third wave targeted only Asian websites, while the first wave hit Wall Street Journal and Jerusalem Post. And uh, it happened to CNN, GameSpot, U.S. Treasury, Sony PlayStation, Washington Post in the past. So let's uh, dissect drive-by downloads. What happens is very simple. Uh, the, the visitor links to an exploit server the exploit server serves him a legitimate page, but in, it includes a browser exploit and a, also a payload or what we call downloader. The exploit uh, and this part is usually obfuscated. So when it executes, it will deobfuscate itself and then it will exploit the browser. And at this time, the dropper will execute, which is the payload or the show code, and it will cause the browser to link back to the malware server. Uh, and the malware server, which is usually different from the exploit server, uh, will distribute malware back. And then finally, uh, the malware will link to a CNC. 
And that's basically the attack. It's very simple. But now the key is who would visit a exploit server? Nobody would. So the key here is traffic. And actually why these two servers are usually separate is because um, at least in Asia, it's, it's two ecosystems. There are people, uh, there are groups responsible for developing the browsers and then uh, developing the browser exploits, and then there are groups uh, responsible for getting traffic to the uh, exploit servers, and then there are groups uh, responsible for uh, developing the actual malware, which is quite hard because that malware has to bypass antivirus. And so what happens is uh, you would uh, typically, the attacker would try to infect one of the very high traffic websites, what Google calls the landing website. And then so from there delivers a URL generator, uh, which is a piece of JavaScript that generates iframes or JavaScript sources typically. And this iframe would then cause the browser to start loading content from the exploit server. Uh, recent incidents, uh, DNF666, uh, and then in May, uh, in May to June, uh, it, um, there was mass, uh, mass shared hosting compromise, uh, which included GoDaddy, Rackspace, Network Solutions, Bluehost, and DreamHost. Some of these, after being compromised, wasn't used to serve drive-by downloads, but instead uh, other types of malware, such as uh, fake antivirus. But some were, uh, were um, after compromise, we're serving drive-by downloads. And then uh, this is a part of uh, a very typical continuous targeted attack, uh, the, same, the, the same incidents to Aurora, uh, that, that basically is a persistent threat. That, that's a continuous threat. Um, and when this happens nowadays, it's very easy, uh, it's very hard to remove uh, because a lot of times the URL generator uh, is inserted not into just uh, a plain PHP file, but it would disguise itself as a, Word, a legitimate WordPress or Joomla file, or it would, uh, it would insert itself into a uh, WordPress, uh, WordPress store procedure or a Joomla somewhere in the Joomla database. So, and, and it's going to take you a lot of time and a lot of SQL commands to dig that out. And then and all throughout this time, you wouldn't know how to remove that malicious iframe or malicious JavaScript from your website. And that makes you look very bad. Uh, and that was uh, all, all we've talked about so far is only one type of uh, malicious JavaScript injection, and that is when they physically tamper your data. Another type is when they don't physically tamper your data. Um, typically, what, what happened many years uh, for many years in the past uh, in Asia is uh, attack with attacks uh, coupled with uh, ARP spoofing. So for example, the uh, ZX ARPS tool is very, very mature, very robust. Uh, if the attacker is able to compromise other machines on the same uh, lane segment as your web server, they may not choose to infect the web server directly because it, it then is very easy for you to find the injection and fix it. They would compromise another machine that can do ARPS spoofing and then would, act, would use a tool like ZX ARPS to act as main in the middle and then, it would, and then it would become the main in the middle and then for every, it would just basically be, uh, be, be passing traffic through but for every HTTP response that it gets from the server it would inject a malicious script or iframe and then pass it back. <clears throat> so in that case, um, you think uh, your visitors tell you that your website is compromised. You go in, you dig the database, you dig the files, you don't find anything. Well, because they haven't tampered anything. <clears throat> in March 2009, <clears throat> what happened was websites like tw.msn.com and taiwan.cnet.com um, and other sites uh, <clears throat> Was, uh, was attacked and embedded with malicious content. And down there you can see a Cisco advisory regarding it. Uh, the incident lasted a total of 12 days before it was totally contained. Because what happened, as we figured out, was the injection was in the middle of the route. So it wasn't on the lane, it wasn't on, it, it wasn't on the web server itself, but it was uh, on one vendor's um, equipment that was um, a layer 4.7 
uh, equipment in the middle of the route that was compromised and that was um, used to inject the iframes. <clears throat> so this is the second type of this type of attack. So now we're going to do a live demo using DIG, uh, using a persistent cross-site scripting vulnerability in DIG. Uh, they have fixed this vulnerability already, but, um, but our, our link is still there. So let's go to DIG first. Firefox, where are you? Oh, lovely Firefox. Okay, there we go. Safari, it's all right. Okay, so usually when, some, when you view one of the dig pages, what you see is this. Um, you would see the, the, the digged, um, the digged uh, link and the description and people who dug it uh, this this kind of thing, but let's look at let's look at uh, the source code. Jeez. Oh, there we go. All right. And here you would see that, let me just zoom it for you, because the room is so big. That includes www.zcrack.org slash G. Um, and it's included as an iframe source, right, as you see here, which shouldn't happen. So it's a, it's a very simple, um, it's a very simple, persistent cross-site scripting that exists in DIG. And the attacker, who is us for the demo, has used that uh, to inject that iframe. So let's uh, start our drive exploit. Okay. So. So we've implemented uh, the Drivesploit framework on top of Metasploit. So now um, I'm starting Metasploit. Get this one a little smaller. And let's, sorry, exploit. And Go to the victim machine. Visit the dig URL. Okay, so as you can see, um, uh, Metasploit serving, and we've chosen uh, to use uh, Meterpreter as the payload. And um, now Meterpreter is uh, starting a new process in my, uh, Notepad and migrate, migrating itself into Notepad. It's completed. Okay, so as you can see, the Internet Explorer is gone, but We now have an open session. Connect to it. See all the processes. So we basically have now uh, a shell into the victim's system. So let's just kill ourselves. And it's attached to actually another process, notepad.exe, so that even though IE, IE is um, dead, it's all right. So I'll kill myself. Okay, 
So that's, uh, that's basically a very simple demonstration of a typical drive-by-download process. So what happened was uh, Dig had a persistent cross-site scripting vulnerability. The attacker used that to inject the iframe. Uh, and uh, in the back end, Metasploit or Drysploit was used to serve the JavaScript, uh, JavaScript exploit. Okay, the motivation behind building this. Uh, we provide, Armorize provides solutions that monitors websites and detect malicious contents 24 by 7. We use multiple behavior, heuristic, and signature-based technologies. Most technologies are developed on our own, but uh, we also integrate in a virus. Uh, because behavior-based behavior technologies that we use are very, very costly, and when you have to scan millions and millions of URLs a day, you end up paying hosting companies a whole bunch of money. So uh, we started uh, a, while back, a while back looking if uh, we can find some antivirus solutions that can be coupled with our behavior analysis. But they're very, very expensive, and uh, so we, set, we spent a lot of time testing our own technologies and also selecting antivirus technologies. And the key is how good are, the key to this type of testing is how good are we and them at detecting new drive-by downloads uh, instead of old ones? But how do you get new drive-by downloads that don't exist? That's a problem. So we, so we ended up uh, getting the old exploits and then uh, and then mut mutating them by hand uh, to generate new exploits and then, and then testing out all these uh, antivirus technologies in our own. And uh, we ended up writing big messes of code. It was very hard to debug. Uh, and it was just uh, taking us a lot of time. So we needed a good framework to help us replicate, manipulate, and mutate exploits found in the wild. Note, note we didn't say obfuscate. Uh, that, there's a difference because when we say mutate, we're changing the raw basic uh, JavaScript exploit in, in its raw form and not in its obfuscated form into new derivatives. So Drysploit is born on top of Metasploit. Initial findings. Antivirus capabilities differ greatly. Desktop and API versions differ greatly in performance, meaning that an antivirus technology which, is, which really performs well for its desktop version may perform very poorly for its API version, which is the version that we want to use, right? It's basically a library or a console um, or an API for us to, to call. And also cost does not equal to performance. Uh, uh, surprisingly, you know, the, the most expensive ones may not be the ones with the uh, best performance, at, at least according to our testing. And so, antivirus versus drive-by downloads. Uh, so, so, so we ended up getting uh, quite confused, and we called. Uh, we started calling these antivirus companies, and we were like, uh, uh, you know, the results don't make sense, blah blah blah. And like, well, what are you testing? Well, we're testing JavaScript, and then they don't want to answer the call, and we uh, call again, and well, we're testing JavaScript. Well, you know, what, can you give us some ex explanation? Well, JavaScript is sissy stuff, you know? We don't, uh, so JavaScript to them is not, is not hardcore stuff. Maybe it's true, right? I mean, I mean yeah, PEs and, and, and everything and assembly, these are very hard. But unfortunately, we have to deal with JavaScript when we deal with drive by download. And so according to their explanation, um, as you can see, uh, in our, in our drive-by download process, the URL generated is JavaScript, the exploits are JavaScript, the malware itself is uh, the PE binary. And they'll say, and, and this is why they said, well, you know, uh, we'll detect this part. So, so during a drive-by download detection process, if that, if uh, in the end, that's going to exist and we're going to detect that. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Why? Because usually a malicious domain serving that uh, that piece of malware is going to be taken down two, three days later, but the injected domain, such as dig.com, dig uh, the injection is still going to be there for a long time. And although that piece of malware is not valid anymore, is not active anymore, we still want to be able to detect that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, nowadays, a lot of uh, DNS, a lot of ISPs, when they find out that that domain is malicious and serving malware, would block that domain 
even though that domain is still active. And then sometimes it's just the, uh, uh, in the economy, the subscription period is over. You bought uh, us, you paid us to serve for two days. It's, it's, it's now past the period. You haven't paid up, so we're temporarily shutting it down. That doesn't mean that we're not going to reopen again. And so we want to focus on all of the JavaScript. And that's why we can't just rely on PE detection. So the deal here is ECMA scripts, which is JavaScript, VBScript, Adobe JS, and ActionScript. And so we want to take this part out. Okay, we want to take this part out and replace the exploit server with, with Metasploit and use Meterpreter or something similar as Payload, which basically does memory injection uh, instead of trying to download a piece of uh, malware and writing it to disk and have that malware do the malicious stuff, we want a payload such as a meterpreter, uh, which, which also exists in the wild, and so that we can test this out and we can test out the abilities of technologies just detecting the injected uh, JavaScript or the JavaScript exploits. So drive-by downloads, what do you want to do? They want to avoid detection at the victim's desktop. They also want to avoid detection by UTM's gateways. And they also want to avoid detection by automated monitors, which, is, which are services like those that we provide, or live for as long, and, and they, they basically want to live for as long as possible. So conclusion, what are you going to do? First, reduce exposure. And you do that by selectively, uh, serve selectively. Uh, for example, you can serve only uh, to each IP only once. You lock the IP that you've served to, because if a visitor uh, if the visitor visits you for the first time and your exploit doesn't succeed, forget about it, right? But don't serve to him the second time because he might be somebody working at an antivirus company. Avoid detection and analysis. Then you got to mutate well. So dry exploit basically is trying to mimic these two goals of dry by downloads. Serve selectively. So at the HTTP level, this is what we implemented into, uh, into DriveSploit. Uh, serve only to fresh IPs. Uh, serve only to particular referrers. Uh, this happened to the Gumbler mass SQL injection uh, that happened uh, in Japan. Uh, and few uh, security vendors were able to detect this uh, on, on the spot when it exploded because Gumbler was very selective about the referrer. It only served to uh, referrers from Google. And in our case, in our example, for example, since we've infect, inf uh, infected dig.com, we can also specify, well, we are going to only serve to referrers uh, coming from dig.com. Makes sense, right? If you're connecting to us directly, sorry, you're not somebody that we want to infect. We want to keep our zero day for a bit longer. Uh, particular agent strings, so that we only serve, if this exploit is for IE7 only, we want to serve to IE7 only. If you connect with the Firefox, we want to serve to you. If you're a Google crawler, if you're Yahoo crawler, we don't want to serve to you. Blacklist, uh, blacklist of security vendor, well-known crawler IPs and security vendor IPs, we don't want to serve to those. And that basically covers the first part, which is serve selectively. The second part, script mutation. This part is for both the exploit and also for the payload. The goal here is not to obfuscate. Um, a lot of JavaScript ex exploits has been using uh, existing JavaScript packers, but um, that's very easily picked up by antivirus. So the new ones all don't. Um, the goal is not to obfuscate, but it is to mutate the raw form and bypass signatures. So we want to tr try not to have fixed components uh, when we generate the JavaScript code uh, or the new mutated JavaScript code. And we want to try to use common operations. So uh, we don't want to use rare operations that nobody used because this, and the virus can say, well, this operation, you know, only 0.01% of JavaScript use those, and they're mostly exploits. We don't want to have those. So uh, this is basically what makes up of a JavaScript exploit. There's a shell code. There's the memory correction part, heap spray, and trigger. 
This is how a piece of shellcode looks like, basically just a very long list of strings, which, uh, which converts to bytes. This is the memory corruption part. Oh, we're using uh, IE peers <coughs> as our example here. Memory corruption part, uh, and we're using the exploit that's provided uh, by Metasploit uh, for IE peers vulnerability. And this is the heap spraying part. And finally, this is the trigger. This is the actual trigger that would execute the, the, the piece of malicious JavaScript. And then usually this whole part is sometimes, uh, especially in the old days, obfuscated into a big block, in, into a big blob, and then deobfuscated. So there's the obfuscated form and there's the primitive form. As we've mentioned in a previous slide. And so you would start with the trigger, and the trigger would then cause the deobfuscator to deobfuscate the blob, and then execute the memory, uh, the heap spray, and then the memory corruption. So with this entire part, the primitive or raw form, we want to mutate, and then for the triggering part, we want to prevent in case we are inside a sandboxed or detection environment. So we want to know if we're inside a sandboxed environment, then we want to prevent ourselves from uh, executing anything. Uh, so mutation features implemented so far. We've implemented five main features so far. One is JavaScript random variable auto replacement. Uh, it accepts a piece of JavaScript. It parses the JavaScript according to the JavaScript grammar. It identifies all names, including variable names and function names, and it auto replaces those variable names and function names with random names. Uh, there is already a class in Metasploit called obfuscate.js that does similar things, but you have to, you have to uh, identify all the names yourself for it, uh, which is very error prone in our testing process because sometimes we, we just miss some variables or function names. And also when we do that, it just uh, creates a big mess. So we want to have one function call and say, this is a piece of JavaScript, replace all the variable names and function names with random variables of our definition. Uh, we want every random variable to be of four to 10, uh, 10 characters in length. So right now it's all random. We're thinking about adding a dictionary to it so it doesn't look strange, right? If, if a dictionary of, uh, I don't know, a thousand words, um, that may work. Uh, and passes back the new JavaScript and a vector of old new name mapping. So you know which of your variable is replaced with which, uh, uh, which name. And this is the actual, this is how you actually use it in Drysploit. The second one is very, very commonly used. It's called JavaScript concat string obfuscation. Um, so this is how you use it. Basically you call it uh, and you give it a piece of string, which can be the shell code. And this is, uh, Metasploit, as you know, has a lot of encoders already. But when you're, when you're putting shell code inside JavaScript, you have a lot of ways to further um, obfuscate that piece, of jo uh, that piece of shell code because you can execute JavaScript. So this is a very commonly used but very effective uh, algorithm, and that is uh, I give you a piece of JavaScript uh, a piece of shell code, and then you split uh, the strings, and then and then you generate JavaScript that add the strings back, um, and pass me back the JavaScript. So I'll show you how this works. This, for example, is our shell code string. We would randomly chop it according to how you want us to chop it. So, for example, chop every four to eight uh, characters. And we randomly chop it into uh, into segments. We would then assign the segments to variables, okay, to layer one variables, and then we would scramble these assignments so that they look like this. All right, so now, as you can see, the middle section appears first. This makes it very hard for, uh, for heuristic-based uh, detection, uh, pattern-based detection algorithms. So that's layer one, and then we would do layer two, right? We would add these we would then add, uh, add these two together into layer two variables, and then we would then again 
scramble these. Okay, and we we'll continue until we add everything together. So finally, uh, this is the script that we'll, pa we'll be passing back to you. Uh, of course, all the variable names are going to be randomized. Uh, they're just uh, put this way for easier reading. Uh, and D1 is underlined because we're going to give you this whole new uh, chunk of JavaScript and the variable name so that you know that that variable name in the end contains your show code uh, string. The third one is JavaScript random text insertion. And what it does is it, it's also very commonly used in the wild. What we want to do here is not just, is not, the goal is not to beat into virus. Uh, the goal is to simulate what's been used in the wild so that we can compare technologies. So, so, insert, so this function call would ask uh, us to generate, drive, ask Drivesploit to generate a random four, uh, four character string and then insert into the original string for every six to ten characters. And then we'll return you the new string. And number four is numeric literal mutation. Uh, a lot of times uh, JavaScript uh, antivirus is sampled by these fixed numeric literals. And so uh, we'll have a function that's a slack space. So basically uh, you pass us a numeric literal or a hex code. And we would then generate, randomly generate a computation that computes back to this, uh, uh, to this uh, hex code or byte, to this byte, right? So that your JavaScript, every time you serve, every time you serve to a new uh, visitor, your JavaScript is going to look every, uh, different every time. Well, that's basically what happens in the wild, so we want to simulate that. And so before uh, your JavaScript code would look like something like this, the line above, now your JavaScript looks something like the line below. Okay. Um, and then for the triggers, so we finished, we've covered uh, dry exploit for the first part, five features for mutation, and now for trigger prevention. Uh, so we, we want to see, we want to know if we're in a sandbox environment. And if we do, uh, and if we're not in a real human's browser, we don't want to execute. And this can be done, uh, a lot of times you see, you see that the trigger uh, function is set on event handlers, div unload, and image unload. Uh, you see more image unload these days. Uh, anybody want to guess which one is more effective? Div? Who think it's div? Who think it's image? Okay, a lot more people for image. Somebody, somebody say why. why? <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on. Why? Yes, yes, the answer is yes. The answer is image unload is more effective, but why? It's, yes. Uh, and the other reason is. Oh, the right answer is image load. Uh, well, image unload is very effective for, um, for some of the newest and very accurate technologies, for example, ours. Um, uh, div unload is very effective for older technologies that do not implement the DOM. Okay, so basically you take SpiderMonkey or Rhino and use it as your JavaScript in interpreter. These in JavaScript interpreters don't have the DOM. Newer technologies like JS Unpack, a very sign, uh, implements the DOM objects themselves. Right, so if, if, you're, you, if you're only using a JavaScript interpreter, uh, because it's very hard to reuse IE, so typically we use some versions of Firefox or just some versions of either Spider Monkey or Rhino, some versions of open source uh, JavaScript interpreter. And div unload is very effective for that, for the older ones, because they don't have the DOM. They don't have DOM implementation. Image unload is effective for technologies that really sandbox IE and run IE as the detector. Because, and the reason is because, well, IE has image unload, but what happens is when you're crawling millions of pages a day, uh, this causes, this introduces a lot of bandwidth. 
And bandwidth and loading big images is just very, very costly. Um, and so there's a feature in IE to disable image rendering, right? You click on tools, options, and you can disable image rendering. When you dis and, uh, and, and some vendors do that, and when you disable that, image on load doesn't fire, okay? So they pretty much figured out what each, what these detectors are, what, what these detectors are doing to detect them. Um, a third one is very, uh, is also very commonly used. Uh, it's just some do while loop, some arbitrary do while loop. But if you see here, what, what's, uh, what's here is um, in a do while, uh, there's an extra semicolon, uh, which is actually a grammatic error. But IA is so smart that it can recover from that and continue while SpiderMonkey or Firefox just throws an exception. So if you're using some versions of SpiderMonkey, it would throw an exception and then it wouldn't execute. While, while if, you, if you're a user using IE, and if I'm serving you an IE-based uh, IE exploit, then it would work just fine. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay, so, uh, so we implemented some of these uh, and, then, and then we tested it out. Um, so we implemented these in dry exploit and then, um, and then we, we generated the XML files and then we uploaded them to VirusTotal. Uh, and we used IE peers as the JavaScript exploit. Uh, the plain IE peers on VirusTotal uh, hit uh, 17 detections And randomizing variables, although it was pretty hard to do, considering we had to parse JavaScript, wasn't really effective. Um, so in Taiwanese, we call this uh, bo cai. It means too bad for us. Um, the, when we used random text injection into the show code itself, we brought this down to 13. So from 17 to 13, which is good. Uh, when we use random variables plus uh, plus string uh, show code string injection plus concatenation, meaning splitting it up, uh, we ended up with 11 out of 42. So from 17 down to 11. So at this point, we pretty much thought that since we reduced uh, six of them, uh, we pretty much thought that roughly six of these antivirus detectors were based on the show code itself. Okay, so we, when we completely scramble the show code, uh, we only bypass six of them, while the others uh, was also sampling the rest part of the JavaScript, which included uh, the memory corruption part and the heap spray part and the trigger part. And so when we used uh, concatenation of show code plus the rest of the code, uh, it came down to one out of 62, which was very good. Which one? <laughs> oh, which one? It's, it's, down, it's down here. It happens to be down here, so um, it happens to be down here. And this one, to be honest, um, is very good. Okay. Ah. And when we used um, injection of the shell code plus concatenation of the rest of the code, just these two sim simple combinations were down to zero. And adding random vars, of course, the same. But and a vi a virus total uses versions that we use, which is the API version or the, um, the console version. Um, but antivirus desktop versions is much stronger. Why? Because they can monitor host environment, they hook into browsers, uh, so it's easier for them to get the raw form of exploit. If you hook into the browser, you can see exactly what the JavaScript engine is doing if you hook deep into the IE JavaScript engine, and as soon as you, you create a new variable with a raw form of show code, then I can say, boom, you're an exploit. So, 
Um, and they, they can also do, do uh, behavior analysis. For example, a buffer overflow behavior or download to file behavior, which makes detection a lot easier. Okay, um, so this is the result of uh, our limited testing of dry exploit against these antivirus. Uh, we listed out, we abbreviated, you can guess. Um, and uh, we, we tried out the big ones. And as you can see, uh, there was one vendor uh, which dry exploit could not beat. Um, and as, as more as, more, uh, as we use more features, for example, concatenation of uh, the shell code plus concatenation of the code itself or injection of the shell code plus concatenation of the code itself, uh, we start to be more and more antivirus. There was one vendor worth mentioning, uh, and this vendor, uh, as you can see, it has two scores because the static, uh, the static part uh, wasn't that good, uh, meaning that if we had if we put all the HTML files that's generated and we ask to scan the folder, it couldn't find a lot of the uh, exploits. But when we actually run the IE and have meta exploits served to us, then it, it, um, it basically using its uh, HIPS, uh, host-based intrusion prevention system, it was able to detect every one of them doing buffer overflows. Okay. Um, so we're, uh, we're originally gonna do a demo to show you how as we add more triggers, we can bypass, uh, add more uh, of these features, we can bypass mo most of them, but I think uh, we're gonna be out of time. And we'll leave uh, time for some questions. So finally, uh, again, this is to be triggering behavior-based encryption. Uh, when we turn on this feature and we submit to WebPub Web, for example, it doesn't find anything. Uh, and what happens is, if you, if you change our eval into alert, uh, and you alert it in Firefox, it doesn't show you anything, okay? But you alert in IE, and it shows you the actual, uh, uh, what we're trying to do, the exploit. So what we did we, is we said, okay, we're gonna encrypt our exploit with a key, and that piece of key can only be generated if you are the correct target browser. So if you're IE7, then you, only IE, if this exploit is for IE7, then only IE7 is, is gonna be able to generate that key. Um, so as you can see, every browser has a lot of different uh, features and different behaviors. Uh, the rendering of CSS is very different from every minor versions of browsers. So we implemented a lot of checks based on CSS rendering, based on uh, HTML parsing, based on JavaScript, differences, all these, we put all these together, and we came up with a lot of checks. So you would say, okay, this exploit works only for IE6. Give me an encrypted version of my JavaScript exploit, and give me JavaScript to generate the decoding key. And the key is only correctly generated if JavaScript is run under IE6. So what we would do is we would say, hmm, okay, in order to correctly de uh, detect IE6, we're gonna, use, we're gonna use this subset of our checks, 1, 3, 4, 6, 8, 9, 12, 14. All right, and we're gonna generate, uh, we're gonna assign them to each variable. We're gonna generate this piece of JavaScript to be served together with the exploit, and then we will generate the correct answers. If you are IE6, the correct answers should be those. And then we would scramble it up. So as you can see, uh, the, the R value is scrambled up, but the, uh, but the L value, which is uh, A, B, C, D, E, remains the, same, uh, remains the same, and that effectively scrambles up the bits, the correct bits, which means although we're serving to a lot of IE6, uh, we're generating a one-time key for every browser. So it's not like IE6, IE6 has uh, always has the same uh, same key, right, because of this randomization. And so we'll use this as the one-time key, and we'll encrypt, and we'll use server-side script, which in case uh, Metasploit is in Ruby, to generate, to encrypt the JavaScript using uh, that key. 
And then we'll generate this, this piece of decoding JavaScript. Of course, all the variables are, again, going to be randomized. Um, and so this effectively is very, very effective right now against most behavior-based behavior -based technologies because unless you're running uh, the, the, the exact version of IE or operating system or, or what have you, uh, then you're not going to be able to decode this piece of JavaScript. So conclusion, why is it so hard for antivirus? Uh, because antivirus is designed to install on desktops and notebooks. So desktop and notebooks have very complicated behaviors, strict resource complaints, and therefore AVs and gateway vendors rely on signature-based technology that has been lightweight and accurate. But JavaScript, especially drive-by downloads, are just uh, in disposable JavaScript. They're generated every time that they're, t they're served. Uh, disposable PDF script, disposable uh, ECMA scripts, basically. And JavaScript packing is the norm. So you can't say every time you see a packed JavaScript, uh, you're seeing something malicious because people love to pack their JavaScript because they don't want their source code to be taken sometimes. Um, Google has JavaScript packer. Yahoo has a JavaScript packer. Um, and Ding at words that everybody uses. And so, so it's very hard to just use heuristics and say uh, packed JavaScript is malicious JavaScript. Okay, how about behavior based? Such as Honey Client, Sandbox, Spider Monkey, Rhino, JSON Pack, WebPub Web, Python Honey Client. Well, use VBScript, for example, is an effective way. We haven't demoed it here. Um, don't serve to detectors, we demo this part. Fingerprint based encryption, and also li very little but effective techniques, for example, sleep for uh, some time, right? Because if you have to scan millions and millions of pages a day, if you're Google, you don't have time to wait for three minutes to see if some JavaScript uh, 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 executes or not. Um, and so that, that, that one line can be pretty effective. Well, it's not sleep, it's set timeout, but it's the same concept, or time lock puzzles. Uh, so future work. Um, uh, what we haven't implemented here that is very widely used is randomly chop off scripts and split into individual files, generating VB script instead of JavaScript, uh, encrypting using uh, data existing outside of HTML, for example, HTTP headers, so that uh, it, you can't submit that piece of HTML to an antivirus vendor because uh, the key to, de to correctly decrypt itself is in the HTTP header, which is not a part of the uh, HTML. Uh, so all these are, are uh, future work, and Drysploit is open source, and we really uh, are looking for contributors to join us. Uh, discussion. Uh, uh, and and uh, the talk that we heard this morning uh, the, <clears throat> uh, uh, by um, Ecursely of EFF basically said that 94.2% uh, of typical desktop browsers are unique, can be uniquely fingerprinted. As you know, drive-by download is widely used in targeted attacks. So if it, the percentage is that high, it, because in targeted, what, what people don't understand about drive-by downloads is it's not the technology. It's not why drive-by downloads are used uh, effectively in targeted attacks. It's not only because of the technology. When you, when, it's, it's when um, it's in, a, in a, what, what's a targeted attack? It's targeted, meaning um, you're a targeted person that, that the attacker wants to attack. You call your colleague and say, hey, I want to know this data. Can you send me the email right away? The attacker knows about it somehow immediately and sends you the email immediately with a drive-by download. That's a targeted attack. Um, and, and this happens quite a lot. Um, and so in a targeted attack, we, this actually can be used because you should have enough knowledge about your target um, to know what his browser is, and then you, and then you can encrypt your exploit so that, oh, that very few brow browsers other than his browser in his environment can decode uh, your piece of JavaScript. And that ends the talk. I'm sorry uh, we're out of time for questions, but I'll be here to answer your questions. Thank you.